On this day, we were emancipated and said to be free, but only from the chains that we could visibly see. On this day, we still strive to stay alive, and like a cage bird, there's still room to move, but to fly is limited. This poem is a reflection of what it means to indeed on Juneteenth still be fighting for our freedom mentally and spiritually. Walk with me as I honor the fight of those who have given us life and those before me. This poem is a testimony of his story and of her story. Our grandfathers, our grandmothers, our great grandfathers, our great grandmothers. Today, you are looking at the product of their faith and resilience, this here DNA be brilliant, it be divine, it be negus, it be astonishing. This be the black archetype, too powerful, a bloodline that carries songs that kept my ancestors harmony. Zing on them southern fields when flesh grew blistered from sweltering sunshine. We still be strange fruit. We still be waiting in the water. Waiting in the water, but this black blood still be thicker. Today, this is a reminder that we are still rooted in resilience. Juneteenth started in Galveston, Texas, and the date, June 19th, 1865, represents the evolution of our country as enslaved Texans learned they were free and the Confederacy had fallen. Here in Connecticut, not only do we acknowledge what unfolded there in Galveston, Texas, but how Juneteenth has led to the emancipation of black Americans across the nation. Connecticut, just one puzzle piece in the story of slavery here in America. The Amistad docked in New London on board enslaved Africans from Cuba who were trying to get back to Africa. One of them, Joseph uh, in Q, uh, he somehow figured out how to take a nail and free them. He freed himself, freed the rest, they took over the ship. This after finding out from a cook on board the Amistad that there were plans in the works for the slaves to be cooked and eaten. It wasn't smooth sailing for them back in 1839. During the day, the 49 men and four children set their sights on the sun with hopes that it would lead them back to Africa. But the ship's Spanish crew redirected course each night. Braxton says the ship eventually ended up in the waters of New England. A United States ship, the Washington, uh, saw them, boarded them, and took it in tow and brought it to New London. There was yet another battle once they reached land. Who was going to have ownership of the slaves? Braxton says that while England outlawed the importation of slaves, people born here in America could be sold into slavery. Local abolitionists gathered to defend the enslaved people against charges of murder and piracy. A young man was found who had been kidnapped uh, from Africa as a child, and he was uh, enslaved in New York. He got his freedom. He could speak the language of the captives, Mende, now Sierra Leone. And as a result, uh, they were able to bring this case to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruling in favor of the enslaved Africans. John Quincy Adams and his group prevailed, and this is the first time that we know of in the history of this land that these people got their freedom and were able to return back to Africa, to Sierra Leone. Although the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863, that did not mean there was freedom for all. It wasn't until 1865 slaves in Texas learned of their freedom on what is now known as Juneteenth or Freedom Day. According to the Pew Research Center, all 50 states have either recognized or observed Juneteenth as a holiday, but only 24 of them offer it as a paid holiday. And for the first time this year, Connecticut will join those states. It's American history and we have really created constructs and confines around not only who we are, but how people should be educated. And the unfortunate side of it is we, we've missed out on the opportunity to learn about some of the, our fellow American brothers and sisters who have not only served in this country, but built this country, have established this country, have sacrificed so much for this country. And I think 
we have done a disservice and not engaging that discussion because it can be a painful one. Um, but I think that there's so much promise and purpose that really comes from having those painful conversations. A big deal now um, that we've done it is going to be to continue to fight um, for the things that we need to still break ourselves free from. Because uh, saying freedom and having freedom uh, are two different things. Trine McGee and Anthony Nolan, two of several state representatives who co-sponsored the bill to make Juneteenth a state holiday in Connecticut. They say it's important to recognize it's not just another paid day off. It is a great thing that we will be able to um, have Juneteenth get recognized. Uh, but there is so much work that our governor has to do and the legislation has to do uh, to make sure that everybody uh, can rise up just like everybody rose up from what they made off of black America, we should have that opportunity too. We're just ready to keep fighting until uh, we get a little more. Between 2014 and 2020, police in the United States killed at least 7,680 people. 25% of those killed were black, although black Americans make up just 13% of the population. In most cases, little or no action was taken against the officers involved. Here are some of the black Americans who died at the hands of police. In recent years, after numerous cases of police brutality across the country and cries for change and accountability, Pastor Dana Smith and Rona Cohen live in New Britain and are active in their community and say the way to change is by having a conversation and understanding. And to understand is to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. My brother was stopped walking down our street often. Um, just for being, just for existing. He was not a part of any criminal enterprise, you know, and yet he couldn't just go to the store, you know, without being afraid. And learn the history that led us here. Even though the police brutality is like now this sort of mainstream topic of conversation, it's always been going on. It's been going on since before you know, since Juneteenth. The traumatic dynamic between people of color and police is one time has not healed. But when you read about that, you have to live that, and then you're surrounded by three officers with their hands on their gun. I mean, even if you ain't doing nothing, it sends shockwaves. But maybe healing comes through a different approach to policing. Places where criminality is treated as a symptom that a community might need something. I think it's mental health services that are so incredibly necessary. I think it's improving the education system and changing it from a school to prison pipeline. By building a relationship. And that's where it starts, where the neighborhoods know the officer and the officers know the people in the neighborhood. In West Hartford, building a meaningful and transparent relationship has been a priority for Police Chief Vernon Riddick Jr. and Assistant Chief Lawrence Terra. For the first time in the department's history, two of the three leadership roles are being held by people of color. And to be the chief at this time, it does show how much things have changed and the opportunities that are here. Uh, still a lot of work that needs to be done. Their perspective has changed the way they train their officers. Police officers standards and training uh, that we send our officers uh, through uh, they've incorporated a couple years ago the history of policing and you know we had talked about trauma earlier and, and what this uniform can represent to certain communities especially communities of color and the fact that we are now training and teaching our new officers about this stressing to their officers the importance of having positive interactions with police by being active in the community we want them to look beyond this look at us look above the collar because we can relate to them, and that's all we want. Once you start talking, what you're actually going to find out how more similar we are than how different we are. These small things add up. Mm -hmm. If a lot of us do it, 
we will make ourselves the best nation in the world. For many, learning about Juneteenth happened later in life rather than in the classroom. And although Juneteenth may not fit explicitly into most curriculum, the foundation of its history is being taught by today's educators. For a lot of different reasons, not all of them, but many of the other Emancipation Days fall, fall by the wayside. The one that remains is Juneteenth. So what is Juneteenth and what are some of the things about this holiday that some local professors teach their students that some may not be privy of? You guys are ready? I sat down with Yukon, Africana, and history professors to find out. Three different professors, all with the same passion for educating our future generation, each with a different story of what Juneteenth means to them. I grew up, um, not my whole life, but much of my life, early life in Texas. Uh, Juneteenth to me was a celebration that uh, was pretty common and it was coming every year. I'm from Jamaica and I came here when I was 12, so I'm only now coming to Juneteenth as a U.S. resident. Um, primarily, we focused on Emancipation Day celebration in the Caribbean and not on Juneteenth, and it's only as a historian that I came to understand the significance of Juneteenth. I've had some childhood experiences. I was raised in Los Angeles, and so the great migration patterns from the South included primarily Texas and Louisiana. So Juneteenth had been a carryover from Texas migrants. But what is the same as their expertise on what is now a federal holiday and the history of Juneteenth, a day when more than 250,000 enslaved black people in Texas were free by an executive decree. These historians say one common misconception is that enslaved people in Texas did not know about the Emancipation Proclamation until General Gordon Granger came to Texas to tell them. It wasn't that legal document that ended slavery. It was the 13th Amendment to the Constitution passed in December of 1865, months after the Civil War was, was uh, over. And uh, so when it comes to Juneteenth, whether the people in Texas knew of the Emancipation Proclamation or not, they were not any more free than the people in Virginia or Georgia or South Carolina who may have heard of it. As, as long as they were under the control of the Confederacy, nobody was, was free. While the journey to freedom was a long one, these historians also remind us that Juneteenth isn't the oldest celebration of emancipation. Take Freedom's Eve or Watch Night, for example, a New Year's Eve service that dates back to when enslaved people stayed up to watch for freedom because the Emancipation Proclamation took effect on January 1st, 1863. People used to celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st. In Washington, D.C.'s Emancipation Day, which is still an active holiday. Slavery ended there in, I believe, on April 16th uh, during the war, and so April 16th is still celebrated there. And while black Americans continue to elevate the voices of our ancestors through these holidays, they say today the country is focused on not only recognizing the impact of slavery and its end, but also acknowledging the next steps to continue to dismantle racism in America. How do we, I guess, simultaneously celebrate freedom? Um, celebrate the umbrella of Juneteenth while also knowing that there's so much more to be done in the United States. We watch what African Americans have always done. They've celebrated this country while also the possibilities. They've celebrated the possibilities of the Declaration of Independence. They've celebrate Juneteenth and July 4th. This is a moment for reflection. We think about Juneteenth, just think about where we are, how we've gotten where we are because of the struggle we've, our ancestors have laid, but also like what we can go. And so hopefully our descendants will look to us and say, well, in 2023, these efforts and strides were made to bring us to where we are right now. now you see lower credit scores in uh, historically redlined areas. You see lower home ownership rates in historically redlined areas. When Fox 61's Juneteenth, Rooted in Resilience, returns. Black Americans have historically faced obstacles in the path to home ownership. The impacts can still be felt today. However, advocates say it's a goal worth fighting for. For many, owning a home is part of the American dream. But for some, there are many bumps in the road to get there. It almost seems as if it's an impossible dream to a lot of black families. Um, so they don't necessarily pursue it. Rashida Rattray is the education and outreach coordinator for the Connecticut Fair Housing Center. 
She says the home ownership gap in Connecticut paints a similar picture of what the issue looks like nationwide. So there is an extreme home ownership gap here in the state. According to data from the Urban Institute, in Connecticut in 2020, home ownership rates for white people were 77 percent, 39 percent for black people, just under 34 percent for Hispanic people, and about 58 percent for people of other races. But answering why this gap exists is complicated. Rattray says the roots of the issue can be traced back for centuries. A prime example of that is during the Industrial Revolution. They were excluded from the housing that was specifically made for those factory workers, right? So there started the tradition of pushing people of color out of safe, affordable places that were resource rich. From zoning laws that supported white home ownership to redlining that deemed black communities risky for lenders, the impacts continue to be felt today. You, know, you see lower credit scores in uh, historically redlined areas. You see lower home ownership rates in historically redlined areas. And even now, more challenges arise. According to the National Association of Realtors, black home buyers are twice as likely to be denied a mortgage than white applicants. And while the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination, by the time it was created, the damage had been done. Just because a law is in place doesn't mean that it erases the regime of, you know, the discriminatory behaviors and policies. There is a mission to change that, though, and some organizations are working every day to help close the gap. Habitat for Humanity helps families get into their first homes, offering lower down payments and affordable mortgage rates if applicants put in what they call sweat equity. That is hands-on, you, you pound nails, you, you're doing uh, flooring, you're actually doing the uh, sheetrock. The, the, from the ground up, you're doing the actual um, building your own home. They also offer financial and educational workshops to prospective homeowners with a goal of giving people the opportunity to create generational wealth they may not have grown up with. Passing down their home to the family, and some of them are just first-time homeowners where they or their family never own a home. Ultimately, advocates say there are resources out there. And despite the challenges, homeownership is an attainable goal. Things that may seem impossible are not impossible. Very possible. Homeownership is extremely possible for people of color. For more information on the resources available, head to our website, fox61.com. Our next stop brings us here to the capital city where Troy Anthony's culture shines through his fashion. I believe in showing wearable contour. So it's, it's clothing that is elevated, but it's very wearable. I tell a fashion story around that through like bold colors and, and um, different uh, designs in those bold colors that complement um, women of color skin tones. Troy Anthony pulls inspiration from different fabrics, textures, nature, museums, and what he picks up while traveling. I got to um, participate in Paris Fashion Week and show a collection that I called Angelic. Um, and it went over very well that I even got invited back. He's also had his work shown at what he calls the mecca of fashion, New York Fashion Week, which he's been in three times. He had this to say to aspiring black designers. Yes, it's not as easy. It's not a, it's not a straightforward path and you're gonna have to um, put in the extra work and you're gonna have to hone in and sharpen your craft. Speaking of putting in work, at East Hartford's diligence training, it's not only about working out. It's like a real community that they've created here. Co-owners Devante Dillon and Terrell Huff take a holistic approach to the wellness of the community. Mental, physical, spiritual, and just overall just uh, taking time to create healthy, sustainable boundaries. Samantha Smalls says those boundaries helped her avoid an impending heart attack at the age of 37. We need to do it for ourselves. We need it to save ourselves. I am here. Thank God I'll be 41 tomorrow. But there was a moment where I wasn't. On Saturdays, it is all about expanding their reach. All the events and um, overall like uh, services that we offer are free to the community from 8 o'clock to 12 o'clock. They also mentor youth through the Gear Up CT program and a partnership with the East Hartford Police Department. How could you put these kids in different programs? How could you um, get kids to get jobs from in town instead of, you know, after high school, after college, kids leave? Like, how could we pour back into this town and, you know, just add value? I feel as though when I step into this facility, it's not like I'm stepping into a job. I feel as though my mission is to overall transform lives. 
This is something that's important to us. It's something that our ancestors have celebrated for years. When Fox 61's Juneteenth, Rooted in Resilience, returns. Juneteenth is also known as Jubilee Day, and places like Galveston are gearing up to open up their first Juneteenth Museum. However, Connecticut is no stranger to Juneteenth celebrations. It is community, it's achievement, it's recognition, it's history, it's celebration. That's what Juneteenth means to Olivia White, who's the interim executive director at the Amistad Center for Art and Culture in Hartford a place that's long celebrated Juneteenth. Well, this is our 32nd year of celebrating Juneteenth, and we were at the time, I would say until very recently, the biggest Juneteenth celebration outside of Texas. Celebrations for Juneteenth began in 1866. Some people held parties, parades, prayer gatherings, and cookouts. For Amistad, it's been 32 years of education, fun, and togetherness. But 2023 is the first year Juneteenth is legally recognized as a state holiday in Connecticut. It's more than just a day off. You know, we, it has meaning and we really want people to understand what it means. And the Amistad Center is hoping that their different events in Juneteenth exhibit will shed light and educate people on the meaning of this day. And so we try our best to make sure that the history is told through various factors of our program to really create dynamic and engaging programming for everyone to enjoy on this very celebratory occasion. Now, whether it's a picnic, a parade, or at a museum, many Juneteenth celebrations have food, and a lot of people tend to support Black-owned businesses like Ricky D's Rib Shack here in New Haven, like we're doing right now. When you think of barbecue, you think of family, you think of, uh, you know, friends. The owner, Ricky, has been in this building for seven years, but has been making finger-licking food for much, much longer. But I always enjoy just, you know, backyard barbecues, family, friends, uh, good music. So he turned that love into his nine to five. And when it comes to people supporting his business during months like Black History Month or Juneteenth, he says... It's good for business. Just like any other holiday, Juneteenth is about being around those who you love, celebrating in Jubilee with your family, like the Ortigs, who's been celebrating Juneteenth for the past six years. Yeah, we usually will do like a cookout at the house or try to support some local events. Juneteenth is a joyous celebration, but the history can sometimes be difficult to grasp. For this family, they can trace it back into their family for generations. It's really cool to have something like this, a picture from 1906 that depicts my family together taking a picture. He says the matriarch and the patriarch in this picture were alive during the first Juneteenth celebration. This is something that's important to us. It's something that our ancestors have celebrated for years and it's something that we, we take pride in. So to see something that is represented and celebrated on a national level and it's being acknowledged by everyone is, is great for us. While people across the state celebrate Juneteenth in different ways, they say the most important thing to do is educate and inspire. June 19th, 1865 to June 19th, 2023, 158 years of freedom, the push for change continues as we continue to celebrate this monumental shift in history. Juneteenth proves we are rooted in resilience. On Juneteenth, we free ourselves from the chains that we cannot see, the lies, the blame, and broken families, disparities, jealousy, envy of physicalities, colorism, lost souls, incarceration, fatality. My brothers, my sisters, I love you always for eternity. On Juneteenth, we celebrate the freedom that our ancestors couldn't truly see. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we shall be free at last.